Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, move to the next session, and I'd like to thank all our experts and discussants for this session. Uh, the next session now we move to a balloon expandable valve deployment. Can I request uh, Ashok to join me over sure. here? Yeah. Dr. Ravinder Rao, Dr. Vivek Javli, our, our star surgeon. Uh, Vivek, please join us over here. Dr. P.K. Hazra, Dr. Ajit Mullasari, and Dr. Sai Satish. Sai, would you please care to join us on the expert panel? On the discussion panel, can I request Dr. Vajanathan, our other star surgeon, Dr. Saurabh Malhotra, Dr. Harpreet Gilhotra, Dr. Om Shankar, Dr. Abhishek Raj Popat, Dr. Pramod Joshi, and Dr. Rohit Manoj. So here we move to another uh, uh, set of uh, exciting presentations. Sai, would you want to join or you want gravity? Okay. So the first presenter will be uh, Pradeep Yadav again, and he has a huge experience with his uh, balloon expandable stent implantations. And he's going to give us some technical tips again, uh, how he sees this procedure to be done. Over to you, Pradeep. All right. Uh, thank you very much once again. That was fascinating talk by Dr. Shah. My disclosures, nothing has changed in 10 minutes. So back to two little or too low or too high, right? Even the sapiens can be too low or too high. I'm going to show you a few case examples and then I'll show you the next generation of sapien that's going to come out. So this valve embolized in the ventricle because it was placed lower than usual, either because the position was low or because the narrow STJ pushed it down. And as the second valve was brought in, fell in the ventricle. And then it's a surgical explant only. You can only imagine what happened to the LV apex here. Sapien not only too low, it can be too high also. Like look at this case, started very well, lost capture, and the balloon was deflated when the capture was lost. Ended up in the aorta, right? Too high. What to do after that happens? Don't let the wire come back. Keep the wire in position. Most times, the sapien, you can drag it to the descending aorta. So open your CT or ask someone to open your CT, check the measurements of your aorta. Like what is the size, where can you, how low can you bring it? Can you bring it infrarenal or do you have to deploy in the thoracic aorta? Inflate the balloon ahead of the sapien, drag it all the way down in the descending and then deploy it in the descending. So basically, Position, pay attention to the THV position right in the, the center marker. Those are the most important 15, 20 seconds of a sapien case. Just like Arjun saw just the eye of the bird, you should be looking just at the marker in your cusp uh, or, or in your coplanar view. This is a very similar example. Notice the marker, the ventricular marker of the balloon is not very nicely aligned to the stent frame one or two millimeter offset, right? Not a big deal. Every day you'll deploy this and nothing will happen except in this case where the aortic side of the valve did not open. Just the ventricular side open, hence it popped up in the aorta, brought it down uh, in the descending aorta and deployed. So pay attention to that, that are you fully, uh, are the markers at the edges of the stent frame or not? Take an extra minute to deploy it. In this case, we just went ahead and deployed a second valve. This was a morbidly obese patient, right? BMI of 45. So with respiration, you see a lot of movement up and down. So sometimes when the movement is happening up and down, you have to time it with the respiration. But anyways, uh, the second valve, we were able to land it in place. Small sinotubular junctions. Like this case, annulus is 593, so clearly a large 29 sapient valve, big sinuses. However, the STJs are 22 and a 25. Coronary heights are okay, just the issue is the STJ is small. It's a Sievers 1 bicuspid valve. And there's an aerogram that shows no surprises. We just see narrow sinus, narrow STJ, big sinuses. And the problem is the sapient will um, hit the STJ. And if I go back and show you the STJ height, it's about 20 millimeters, right? So 29 millimeter sapien is how tall? 
it's 22 millimeters. And if you implant it a little bit lower in the annulus, like 80-20 implant, you'll still have 18 millimeters. So we can land the sapient 18 millimeters above the annulus, so we'll be below this STJ. The key will be to deploy it lower. This is an example, uh, or we're just getting ready with this sapien. And here is the deployment. Uh, let's see. Okay, pacing on. We typically don't pull the pigtail, at least in our practice. In this case, because of shallow STJ, we pulled. And even at half inflation, when you do an aerogram, you can appreciate how big the balloon looks, right? So the key here is not to inflate the valve fully. Just do a partial deployment, deflate, this will anchor the stent frame, deflate, advance the balloon forward, and just do the ventricular dilation. This way what you've done is you've avoided STJ injury from the balloon. If the STJs are calcified, they will watermelon seed it down in the ventricle. If they're not calcified, you'll cause an injury. So two-stage uh, deployment in case of very narrow STJ. This is the final result, calcium. So this is an example of a 72 year old male, usual comorbidity is just a very high risk patient and severe aortic stenosis, mean gradient 58. Bicuspid valve annulus is H76. And as you know, the cutoff, the IFU cutoff for 29 sapien is 683. However, this is a bicuspid, right? So we can, afford to deal with a little larger sinuses and it's so heavily calcified the anchoring is not an issue the valve will anchor big sinuses issue is ton of calcium look at that fluoro screen if you can see it from back there ton of calcium access is not an issue we went ahead and did simulation uh, that we are developing with our georgia tech partners just to understand what's going to happen to the calcium. And you can see that both platforms push the calcium towards the left coronary. Big chunk all get pushed to the side. And then we went ahead next step and assessed the wall stress on the aorta. This wall stress is in megapascals, and you can see if the, in the middle picture, if it's a 29 nominal deployment, wall stress is 0.65 megapascals, and the thresholds for annular rupture in, on this software is around one. So we're feeling very good that, okay, despite the calcium moving, moving all the one side, we will not have a rupture. You can also assess pacemaker and PVL risk for these cases. Uh, on the software, you can see a very little green here, so this, this should give only mild PVL. So with all this information, just an extra planning, we went ahead and proceeded with TAVR as opposed to surgery for this case. This is the root angiogram. Typically, we don't do TEs, just like everybody else uh, here also. But in this case, to be extra cautious, plan this with TE and cerebral protection. BAV, you can see the calcium moving all to one side pre-dilated, the valve sitting in one commissure, and then deployed the valve to the nominal volume. Remember, this was an 800, over 800 annulus, still a nominal 29, post-dilated, just because there was so much uh, waste in the middle, and a final aortogram. Intra-op TE, very good, just a mild a PVL or trace PVL, Mean gradient was a little bit high, which actually came down to around 10 millimeters at 30 days. And on CT, that just shows exactly what we had predicted. The calcium will move all to the left side, but not puncture the sinuses. So calcium, you can deal. This is what I grew up, and I'm sure everybody here has seen this. You can deal with your enemy, but at least respect, prepare, plan. And like Dr. Sievers was saying, uh, Earlier on, you know, we interventionalists sometimes get arrogant. Like, yes, I can do anything and everything, but just take a moment to respect and be prepared. So with that note, I'll show you the next generation of the Sapien valve. So these are the valves that we're using right now in the US as commercial, Sapien 3 and Sapien Ultra. I think here we're using Sapien 3. The difference in Ultra is the skirt, right? The skirt is taller as compared to Sapien 3. And what that did was, it's already commercially used in the US, and what Ultra did was, it reduced that mild PVL from about 14% to around 
So a lot of your sapient cases, you'll see mild PVL. That's going to go down when you start using ultra. But that's not enough. We need to further go to the next generation of sapiens that focuses on optimizing index procedure, making it reproducible. We want less PVL and then make the valve more durable as we're going towards younger patient. And then commercial alignment is really the buzzword these days. That's what we want. So all of these features are being brought in by Sapien X4. That's the next generation of Sapien coming in. As you can right away see, the stent frame is different. It's the same cobalt chromium alloy, but the frame design is completely different. It doesn't foreshorten as much from the ventricle because this is essentially like a coronary stent design. The leaflets are completely new. It's a resilia tissue. This resilia tissue is so popular and is being used in the surgical valve in Spiris by Edwards with excellent durability so far. So Edwards has brought in the same resilia tissue in their Taver valves. And then the skirt is actually even better than ultra. How? They made it denser. It's much dense fibers. Sapien 4 or X4 is only available in three sizes. They got rid of 20 millimeters. However, the range of annulus is actually larger. It can go up to 744. And guess what? Just by change of volume in the syringe, you can get 16 different sizes of X4s. For example, if you have an annulus that is somewhere in the 27.5 diameter, you will get a 27.5 millimeter X4. You don't have to under deploy a 29 S3. This is a typical, um, I'll skip that. Delivery system is more or less the same. The valve will actually be mounted on the balloon itself. So no more assembly in the abdominal aorta, it's ready to go. Regular commander system, valve rotation control, the very distal end will be for commercial alignment. You can really align this valve. How do you do that? Once you're in a coplanar view, unlock the valve and this back end you rotate it. You see a little marker right there in that red dot? It's a C. You clock that back end, that C will come right on your guide wire. That's all you need to do. And that will make sure that you're perfectly commercially aligned. You advance the valve in. I'll show you again. That marker is on the side. Sometimes it's already on the wire, but if it's not on the wire, a simple rotation, just a quarter degree turn on that back handle will bring that C on the wire. That's all you need to do. So this Sapien X4 is being studied as part of the Alliance trial, which is a prospective single arm multicenter study in North America. 765 patients, all risk patients. It has a dedicated bicuspid registry and a valve and valve registry usual endpoints. These are the study committee. Tamim and Rahul are the national PIs for the main cohort. And I have the privilege of being the national PI for the valve and valve cohort, our usual steering committee members, and the North American sites. So in conclusion, balloon expandable valve is a workhorse valve that can treat wide variety of anatomies. X4 is the next generation, brings commercial alignment, personalized <laughs> valve sizing, better PVL, and the resilient tissue technology. We've already done around 15 to 16 cases in the US with these X4, but because of confidentiality, I, I'm not allowed to show you uh, the angios. Thank you very much. Perfect. That's, that's, these are the different situations one can get into with a balloon expandable. So uh, maybe two comments. Uh, Ravinder, you have been using a lot of sapiens and uh, I think like a great add? cases and everybody's excited though for these future valves uh, which can address the unmet need uh, of the current uh, limitation of the valve. So I think, um, but I, you rightly pointed out uh, uh, balloon expandable and implanting in a calcified anatomy. But I think if uh, there are safer alternatives where people can choose for an Evolute Pro, I mean this can, or this type of calcium and a balloon expandable can only be done by an expert like you. So it's very important. Uh, what about uh, the polymer-based uh, Poldex system? I mean, do you have any access to these Poldex valve? We don't have at our center, uh, but they are emerging, and time will tell, you know, what their studies look like, but definitely some excitement on towards that. Because you don't have to kill uh, buffaloes and pigs for that, uh, and the lifelong diet. At least in the U.S., we're killing them for breakfast anyway. <laughs> 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 yeah. Pradeep, uh, 
one comment from you, and I think it's very important to put into perspective of a lot of people here. Uh, unfortunately, when we talk about valves in one session or the other, then we sort of make it sound as if there is no other valve apart from a balloon expandable valve, or maybe a self expandable session would talk about there's no other valve like a self expandable valve. And yet, every day, our decision making in the heart team meeting that we have for every case is I go in with a totally blank thought process as to whether I'm going to put a balloon expandable, self expandable. I go in assessing every aspect. Then, often at times, when I thought I'd put a self expandable, I put a balloon expandable. On the other hand, I'd change over from a balloon to self expandable, looking at every aspect, including the approach to the aorta, including the horizontal and the horizontality, looking at the calcification, bicuspids, 30% of our cases, where would the leaflet open up? Would I be supraannular? What sort of valve is it? Is it less than a 23 millimeter balloon expandable? A number of issues come to my mind, including do I want to shove in a big sheet through a 5.5 millimeter when I have the option of another valve? So, so here is my question to you. Do you, are you absolutely no self-expandable, only balloon expandable, or do you make your decisions also very meticulously on this issue? And that's for, yeah. for, for learning for people. Yes, sir. So most times, I would say maybe three-fourths of the times, you can do either valve and you'll be fine. It's that one-fourth of the cases where all the points that you mentioned can really fine-tune your case. For example, a small, very small annulus. Do you want to put a 20 millimeter S3 or do you want to put a 26 millimeter S3 versus let's say a 60 year old male right who's going to need a second valve do you want to put a self expanding tall valve supraannular cause issues for future tavering tavern or you want to put a shorter valve frame they have patent coronary so I think in one fourth of the cases you want to be open minded and just see what is best suited for the anatomy not so much what suits you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Pradeep. Uh, it's uh, one nice one question. One question. And uh, while we invite the next uh, speaker, maybe there was a question coming up. So I'll invite uh, Dr. Praveer Agarwal to show a very interesting case. Praveer, are you here? Yeah. So we were. Uh, is a comment uh, from the panel. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, I want to know how much uh, uh, safe over expansion can be done in S3 uh, than the nominal volume, because this can be particularly relevant in. Uh, um, well in well, especially TMBR. Uh, the maximum over expansion we have done is 8 ml uh, in TMBR without causing leaflet uh, malcoaptation. So, what is the safe over expansion in S3? Ravinder, you want to take that? Yeah. So, uh, uh, there are two ways to answer that question, sir. What is the percentage oversize which can be achieved in the balloon expandable valve safely? And the second uh, is, what is the largest size annulus which can be treated by an undersized sapien valve by putting additional cc's to it? So I think that is relevant only for a 29 millimeter valve. But you can, you, there's also a 32 millimeter valve. So for a 29 millimeter valve, an additional five to seven cc's has been added. We have treated annulus as large as seven, seven, nine, 750. I don't know the exact answer that what is the cutoff limit to it. But what I can think of it, if you add more than 5, 7, 8 ml, there can be a malcoaptation in the leaflets and there can be a central AR. So I don't know the exact answer to it, uh, but it is only relevant for a 29 millimeter valve when the annulus is too big. Thank you. Over to you, Praveer. So last session, we had an interesting discussion going on with the coronary protection. So another case in that uh, chain. Right. Good morning, everybody. First of all, let me give it lighter. You have seen since morning that so many complexities are there in these cases. But start seeing that coronary that when we started doing somewhere in 90s, it was a similar kind of thing. So it's not difficult. You have to just make it very sure that you make your plan in a, in a perfect manner. Right. So we are the beginners. We can say that in the tower. But still, I think a lot of exposure now is there for tower. And all the things can be done if you plan it very properly. So my case is a simple one. Uh, it's a 67-year-old lady, severe breathing difficulty for, uh, for on effort for last uh, more than one year, increased for the last few months. Effort related angina, echo, severe aortic stenosis. Just see the findings on echo, ejection fraction 20%. LVID is high. 
gradient is coming at mean gradient with an EF of 20%, 59. And a severe calcified aortic valve, moderate PAH, RARB dilated. So it's a bad case. Now see, uh, it's a bicuspid aortic valve uh, with moderate calcification. Another uh, feature is low coronary height. The left side is only 9.7 and dilated ascending aorta. Uh, the area derived is coming as 21.3. LVOT is fine, about 23.4. Right coronary height is fine, it's about 12.8. And uh, once you know the bicuspid aortic valve and low coronary height, it's a problem. So these are the uh, like uh, CT parameters, like uh, area derived, all we have seen. And it's a type 1 uh, bicuspid aortic valve where the like, cusp is fused and one cusp has become large and calcified. So these are the same parameters seen in different like views. Uh, the axis is fine uh, on either side, so we chose the right axis. The valve we chose was about uh, like uh, for for a bike spirit valve we wanted to oversize about six to eight percent. This was coming twenty one point five with two cc uh, extra. That's the first shot. Oh, sorry, it's a heavy calcium, left dominant system, fused leaflet, which has become big with calcium towards the left coronary ostium, and it's a very very tiny opening. Uh, it was very difficult crossing this valve. It's a heavy calcium sitting there. Uh, it took about 15, 20 minutes just to cross the valve. And with the guidance of like, uh, with the calcium node, we could cross it. And it's a left dominant system, so the whole system is coming to the left side. So considering low coronary height of the, uh, and fuse calcified leaflet toward the left ostium, coronary protection with guide of uh, wire and Stent pre placed 5 into 16 decided. All were going fine, there was no problem. So, pre alteration was done with 18 minutes of balloon, and uh, we planned to inject at that time, but the injector did not work. So, we were not in our own lab, so we can't say much to it. They said, the, Sorry, injection is not working. So, we couldn't realize that when uh, the valve opens, whether the coronary will occlude or not. But we had no option but to go ahead. We already dilated that. That's the placement of valve. We're going very slow initially. And then go up and up. It was 21.5 meter valve with 2 cc extra. Deploy, the things were fine. The patient was very stable at that time. Now see, these are the pictures taken. The patient was very stable, BP-140 systolic. And uh, I could see something at the ostium of the left main, but we took four few more views. Uh, the people with me, they said that, look, we wait for about 10, 15 minutes. If nothing happens, already patient is very sick and we, we are done with the procedure. But I was still not very, very happy, right? And uh, after the deployment, the patient was stable, so they said, uh, why can't we wait for a few minutes more and then see? And after about 10 minutes or so, they decided that, look, we should just remove this tent and we should not deploy it. Uh, once you are operating outside, you don't have everything in your hand. You're just there at times to assist them. So they said, okay, fine, you can take it out. And that was a disaster. So within minutes after blood pressure came down to from 140 to 40 systolic, the picture is not there. We could see some staining on the, on the left system. The dye was staying in the, in the circumflex. We could see that. So the picture could not be taken because it was a, like a very bad situation. The patient was crashing right there on table. And as we had already the guide and everything on table, so I could uh, quickly go there. And you see, as I'm injecting with the, with the guide and the wire is going up there, you can see some contrast filling the left system. So already the things were in place, and uh, fortunately, with the like, uh, we say the God was kind to me on that particular day. We could recross within, I think, maybe in in, in a minute's time, 
And as soon as the wire was in, the leaflet which was occluding the uh, coronary, the blood started flowing in the coronary artery, the patient came back. The pressure started rising. We were again back towards say, maybe more than 100. And we had some time to place the stent, um, like uh, it was already there on table, so we did not take much time to even search it out. And after positioning in a proper manner, the deployment was done. You can see we can very well holding on. We are catching the ostium, which was required. It's a 516 stent deployed at nominal pressures as a routine practice. Like uh, we came back slightly back so that now we are into the aorta and the distal part is safe. We went on high pressures and deployed it further better. Came further back, went really to what say uh, 18 or 20 atmospheres so that make it very big. And by this time the patient was very stable. And that was the end result. The coronary is flowing fine and the patient was exhibited the very next day and discharged for four days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So those images are breathtaking, you know, the, the one where you've got a linear shadow across the left vein. Yes. That's, that's where the, yes, and this is what one, is, it's a teaching, you know, one has to look at such things very carefully when you have a doubt in your mind. Ashok and then Ravinder. And yeah, so, so this, is, this is a great case and, and I think uh, somebody said earlier, uh, when in doubt, just stent that ostia. The, the other aspect of stenting osteas is, that you just don't stent ostia, you never are accurate, you actually bring it back because that's the only way the leaflet, it's the leaflet causing it, it's not the ostia, it's before the ostia. So you bring the stent back, certainly for self-expandable, you bring it back a lot because it'll actually be caught in the waist. You actually have to bring it e even 10 to 12 millimeters back so that it's actually like a chimney. chimney. Create a chimney. <clears throat> but while this, you can just bring it to the outside the frame because access subsequently becomes easier, but it should still, still come into the frame and not be beyond the frame. And finally, you know, uh, LAO projection, LAO cranial projection is the best one. Bicuspids are, are the worst ones. Uh, you can never understand them because they are eccentric. There's chunky calcium. So occlusion of the coronary arteries is not just only related to sinus width and sinus height and coronary heights. It's also related to the length of the leaflets and bicuspid and the position of calcification on them which all needs to be understood to actually prevent coronary occlusion. It's just a thought, like if you have just simple balloon, if you push the leaflet down and do the imaging, can it do away with the stent? It can bounce back, but it can give it a thought that this leaflet can come down and you can avoid a stent. Because there is recent registry published reverse tavern. If you put a stent or no stent, that doesn't make any difference in the long term. Reverse tavern registry mm -hmm. with this type of complication. So plain you put a plain balloon versus stenting, right? Yeah. Uh, Just simple balloon and push that leaflet down, image it, and if there are. You could see that as I uh, like, uh, you see the first image when I took it after post round, there was a full uh, leaflet which had a calcium was covering the osteo. I could see that. In the other view, it was not visible. So they were misled by that. They said, uh, oh, so the patient is doing fine. It's a bad case. Why, 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 why do we put the stent in? So I said, okay, fine, you can wait. So wait for 10 minutes. Fortunately, it was very stable for 10 minutes. So, but um, it was a bad case. And I, I don't think the balloon is going to push that down further on. It will further come back. And yep. I think it's a good idea to put a stent there. Ravinder, would you balloon alone or no, no, always stent? But what I would do in that, uh, but great save, sir, great case, congratulations. So See, the what, next what, are the, L what are the outcomes uh, when you perform yeah, let, a target? Let Dr. Ravinder complete his... Uh, one one yeah, view, uh, uh, once you see that opacity in front of left main, sir, go to LAO cranial, remove parallax in the valve, and then you can clearly see the relationship of left main, leaflet, and valve. And also place the stent in LAO cranial, because then you can see the valve frame, and you can, because the stent has to come back and the idea is to push down the leaflet. There are case reports where people have put two stents because the radial strength of leaflet is so high, it can again crush the stent. But I think a uh, great save and great case. Uh, I really remember this was a very, very bad situation where uh, the thought process really is not there just to save the patient because the patient is crashing and caught this blood pressure and you were hardly a few minutes to move everything. So I agree with that. If uh, like uh, these things happen like once in a while, once they happen, but I was very sure that uh, the things may go worse. So I was prepared mentally for it. 
I wanted them to just deploy this at that time only. They never wanted that. Because I was I was talking, I was uh, standing behind and they were in front. They said, no, no, the subjects are looking fine, the student program is not going And just don't uh, make it a bit more complex. And just, uh, Saurabh, you had a comment? Yeah, yeah. so and then what, what are the outcomes of TAVI when it's performed in the patient with RV dysfunction along with LV dysfunction? Would you still go ahead if the RV dysfunction is severe and would you have, uh, expect a good outcome following a TAVI? And secondly, had this patient had a non-dominant RCA which was low line, would you still protect it or would you let it occlude? No, no, but so, RCA are not, not protected and likely is not to protect it or like, uh, It's a very small circulation, they could not uh, do any damage to the patient. And RV dysfunction certainly will be more uh, uh, like uh, careful with the procedure, but I think outcome is nearly the same and they improve. All, all of these are dysfunctions, they are all related to the other valve. They improve with time. Yeah. Ajit? Yeah. This, this is a classic patient where you'll expect trouble. Bicuspid aortic valve, a lot of calcium in the left. And a big uh, leaf flat. You have to take an LAO view, uh, you know, and seeing that sort of whitish thing around i would be taking an lao making sure everything is okay and i would err to put the stent rather than back out i think otherwise you get into trouble with this coronary occlusions can occur a few hours later can occur even on the on, on uh, in the ccu and that's why it's not a good idea to just leave it because it's fine on the table any any doubt do it the outcomes of these patients have been followed up for two to three years, and there's enough data around that they tend to do very well, uh, and certainly don't suffer from any restenosis or any adverse outcomes, as opposed to the usual patient you haven't stented the mains. Thank you, Praveer. This was uh, quite uh, stimulating for us, and we'll be on the lookout for the coronary osteum always. Ravinder, over to you. And Ravinder is going to, uh, he doesn't need much introduction. He's traveled the whole country. Uh, proctored so many of our younger colleagues over here also. So today, uh, the task on Ravinder is to talk about uh, valve in a valve case on the surgical. Can I have my slides? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be at this meeting. And thank you very much. So my talk is on valve in valve tower. Uh, some of my slides are uh, borrowed from Dr. Grube's presentation, so thank you very much, sir. And uh, why valve in valve? We all understand because all these bioprosthetic valves fail and a redo surgery carries a very high risk chance of uh, complications. These are the mechanisms, the way a bioprosthetic valve fails. There could be a weird tear, calcification, panis formation, endocarditis, or a thrombus formation. I just wanted to share some data from the valve in valve registry because this will help us to understand how do we plan our valve in valve cases. So again, the patients were randomized to core valve and Edward Sapien 3. And you can see majority of device core valve was 26 millimeter uh, in 80% of patients, 20 mil, uh, and 20% 20 of patients got 29, Sapien 82% patients got 23, and 18% patients got 26. Remember, this data is from Northern America and Europe where the average aortic valve size which is implanted is bigger. In our country, the average uh, aortic valve implantage, implanted is around 19 or 21 millimeter. We rarely see a 23, 25 millimeter valve. So again, uh, the coronary osteal occlusion in these procedures was 3.3% for self-expandable, 4.2% for balloon expandable. All-cause mortality was 7.5% for self-expandable and 12.7% for balloon expandable. But this is very important. In small surgical bioprocesses, 25.9% of patients had elevated gradients. And what is the what, what do we mean by elevated gradients? Mean aortic valve gradient of more than 20 millimeters post-procedure. So what, 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 what did this study uh, teach us? This study was done in 2011 uh, period. So we clearly identified that patient process mismatch, proper valve selection, and optimization of a bioprosthetic valve and valve procedure is very important. So first step, we need to identify the surgical heart valve. The way to identify, look at the surgical node, they can be a, a, a patient might carry a card, that what type of valve was implanted. Then we need to understand the ID of the valve. So porcine valve, the ID decreases by two millimeter, pericardial valve, the ID decreases by one millimeter, and there is a bioprosthetic tissue valve where the leaflets are on the outside, so there is no decrease in the ID. THV valve selection, very important. Previous surgical valve size, we need to understand. Then the operator experience or expertise, fluoroscopic landmarks of the valve, 
and coronary relationship. These are the things which we need to know even before we plan our transcatheter valve canal procedure. But, you know, because now uh, majority of the operators would have done uh, TAVI valve canal procedures, I'm just going to highlight important uh, things which we should focus more. Risk of coronary obstruction. The incidence is less than 2%. And how does coronary obstruction happen? It is the interaction between root size, coronary height, type of bioprosthetic valve, and very important is the VTC. If the VTC distance is less than 6 millimeter, there's a high chance of coronary occlusion. And you can see in these pictures, which explains how coronary occlusion happens when we do a valve in valve procedure. So how to optimize a valve in valve tower? Valve selection, very important. My talk though is on balloon expandables, but I'm going to talk about how to select the right valve. Depth of deployment, very important. Hemodynamics, optimize the hemodynamics and coronary protection. So there's a concept of bioprosthetic valve fracture. So it's more relevant in our Indian population because as I said, majority of these patients have 19 or 21 millimeter valves. So we should know what valves can be fractured, Biocore, Epic, Mosaic, Magna, Magna East, Mitroflow, and new regeneration Perimont valves. Valves that can be remodeled, means you do a post dilatation, but you cannot fracture them. Trifecta, Carpentier, Edwards, Standard, and these are the names. Valves that cannot be fractured, Hancock II and Abolis. These are the steps. Uh, I think it's there on the internet and the presentation, but the way to fracture is you use an inflation device and a 50 cc syringe. Do a rapid pacing, first inflate the balloon with the syringe because it's very difficult to uh, uh, inflate with an inflation device. And once the full volume is there in the balloon, then you go with the inflation device and all balloons and all valves have their standard pressures, some fracture at 16 atmospheres, some at 18 atmospheres. And what do you look for? Disappearance of the waste and drop in the pressures. And then definitely it improves the hemodynamics. This is very important when we do a valve in valve procedure. Post procedure, the hemodynamics should be uh, appropriate and acceptable. This is just one slide I want to touch on Basilica procedure, leaflet cutting tools. These are coming, the dedicated leaflet cutting tools which will be available. There was a presentation at Euro PCR, and it is very important when we are doing a valve in valve procedure and when the VTC is very low. Let us look at a case, 71-year-old male, surgical AVR with 25 magna, done in 2006, failed in 2021, comes for a valve and valve tower. Balloon expandable versus self-expandable. Now, you see the previous surgical valve is 25 millimeter, and the balloon expandable, which we can use in this, side, in this case, is a 26 millimeter. And that is why, because it's a larger anatomy, I've chosen a 26 millimeter balloon expandable uh, Sapien 3 valve. So this is sometimes crossing a... Uh, Failed bioprosthetic valve can be a challenge because the opening can be very eccentric. But these are standard. Once you go ahead and cross, this is a sapien valve uh, which is mounted. And if you can see, the way it is deployed is you match the top end of the frame with the top end of the bioprosthetic valve because it's going to foreshorten only from below. And then do a rapid pacing. And then this is how it looks like post procedure with acceptable gradients. But look at the case number two, 78 year old female history of surgical AVR with 19 mm trifecta in 2015. What are the challenges here? Small valve, leaflets on the outside, high chance of patient process mismatch and coronary occlusion. So look at the CT scan, the perimeter is 53, area is 223. The only valve which can be used in this situation is a supraannular self expanding valve. But the important thing which I want to highlight here is the VTC again. So you see coronaries are low, but the VTC is uh, 9.2 mm, more than 6 millimeter. So there's very low chance of coronary occlusion in this patient. So this standard and trifecta valve, the, this, uh, how, why this CT scan uh, slide is important, you can see how the valve is sutured at the level of annulus. Sometimes the valve can be very, you know, obliquely placed and can be towards the left main. But here you can see the valve is away from the left main. And then I'm not going to go in detail, but the trifecta valve has got leaflets on the outside and carries a high chance of coronary obstruction. But this patient, uh, the VTC is 9.2. So important thing in this patient is to optimize the hemodynamics. This is a coronary angiogram just to show the relationship of the coronary artery to the uh, valve. And again, the crossing was a challenge in this patient. You can see uh, this is a JR catheter, which I have used to cross. Major, this is maybe one or two times where I had to use a JR catheter to cross a valve. And that's because the opening becomes very eccentric uh, in a failed bioprosthetic valve. And here's a 23 millimeter Evolute R. And to get the benefit of supranular design, you need to implant it very high. If the valve is deep, 
the benefit of a supranular uh, design is lost. So uh, Dr. Ashok said, sir, had pointed out all the right steps to do a, a self-expandable valve, follow these steps, uh, zero implant, and then wait for five minutes and see how it goes, and then do a very slow release at the end. And this is uh, angiogram, there is no leakage, but should we go ahead and do a post dilatation? Very important. This was a 19 mm trifecta valve, but what we know, we cannot fracture it, but we can definitely modify it. And the balloon chosen is a 20 millimeter uh, balloon. The balloon has to be 50% into the LVOT and 50% in the valve because the LVOT portion of the balloon will anchor the valve. You cannot be very high. So pace at 180 to 200 and then inflate with the 20 millimeter balloon. And this is the final angiogram. So take home message for a valve in valve procedure, very important. We need to plan to prevent three things. Patient processes mismatch, coronary occlusion, and the correct valve selection. Thank you very much for the kind attention. Well, these are not the easy procedures, like you have uh, mentioned. Uh, yeah, the future is uh, resilia. Resilia. Yeah. The Good. surgeons, Vivek. after comments from yeah. Dr. Hazra, then we'll ask Vivek. Okay, Resilia, they have adjustable rings. Uh, you can stretch it further. And you have adjustable stents now, like you have a polymer hinge that can break once the polymer is dissolved. And um, sometimes you have to take the balloon out and you have to see whether the pinhole rupture of the balloon because that can give rise to a self uh, in false sense of uh, rupture of the ring and you have to go again. These are but nice presentation. Thank you. So Vivek, uh, Vivek I, I would like yeah. you to comment on, you know, the more, the new Resilia valve uh, yeah. with a view to valve and valve later. That's the first step. And I also want you to comment on the fact that the trifecta is usually a valve you actually implant supra uh, The surgeons implant that supra -handler. In fact, when you implant too shallow a valve and valve, I found that you all can actually miss it and therefore you actually be three or four millimeters down, primarily because this is a supra annular valve with the surgeon's implant. So it's not at the analyst. <laughs> when you look at this uh, whole thing from a surgeon's perspective, it's been very heartening to see from the time we got the Sedlinger technique to the complex valve in valve that how these techniques and technologies have come down on the earth from the skies, how people at much junior level are doing it so sleekly. But your last slide was prevent, uh, plan to prevent. From surgeon's viewpoint, it's so important in today's uh, turbulent period that plan to prevent valve in valve. So it's very important at what, at what age, which valve you put, the correct role for mechanical valves and the complete cessation of any more research R&D in mechanical valves and proper anticoagulant uh, new drugs for these valves has also paid a cost. And it's so common in India to see a 19 trifecta or even for that matter 19 Edward coin carpentier and lesser the size of the valve faster is its uh, demise and then lack of uh, enough uh, incidences of doing root widening so these are the things which cardiologists cardiac surgeons should together discuss and force each other and it's very important to draw the line I'm seeing so commonly in Bangalore people at the age of 50 being put with bioprosthesis. The last CM whom I operated, I was forced to put a bioprosthesis perimount early at the age of 47. It's go, you go in seven, eight, nine years max. <coughs> and uh, so by the time they are 60, they are there for valve valve. And that how long that valve valve lasts in that such a small annulus. So I think those are the things which a surgeon feels we should draw lines, look at it collectively very seriously. Are you putting in more and more resilient valves with a view for the future? Yes, but the problem is when new device comes, there is a lot of support, noise, uh, and after 10 years we realize how much was noise and how much is reality. Right. So, so basically, I think the complete cessation of R&D in mechanical valves and the newer anticoagulation applications to them, and also the, our insensitivity to drawing line on the age is disheartening. Ravinder was saying something. I think those are very relevant comments, sir, because as we also see in our practice, patients at the age of 60, 65 would come with a bioprocessor valve fracture. As per the current guidelines, we would go ahead and do a sorry, bioprocessor valve failure. As per the current guidelines, we would go ahead and do a valve in valve. 
the point uh, will become more uh, concerning 10 years down the lane. Now the patient has a tissue valve, the patient has a tivy valve, and tivy valve fails. Yeah, absolutely. Any more comments? We have more surgeons on that side. Uh, well, if you go to the historical perspective of aortic valve replacement from surgical standpoint, uh, the first aortic valve replacement was done in a heterotopic position. It was done in the descending aorta by Dr. Huffnagen. And uh, as of now, we still have a procedure which is called apico aortic conduit, uh, which is basically bypassing the uh, native LBOT and the aortic valve. So I was looking at the presentation of a valve in valve, uh, in especially uh, after a failed self-expanding device and there was a lot of discussion about coronary occlusion and a hostile uh, anatomy in terms of VTC less than 2 or 3. So what would happen if you implant a tower valve supra in a supracoronary fashion? Because you already have a platform, you have a landing platform in a balloon, in a self-expanding device. So you implant the aortic valve, tower valve, supracoronary. I think it will not be stable. I, it's a hypothetical question that we are implanting a balloon expandable in the outlet of the outflow of Evoluta. I don't think it will be stable. Yeah. Coronary well, well, there coronary are coronary filling in a apico aortic conduit. And there are coronary filling in the valve when you are deploying in the descending aorta. That Cor was the first aortic valve replacement. So coronary can still fill because you can do it with the but it will never be stable. I don't think so. Yeah, I, don't, I can't think of the stable. Stable Eric gives me one concern. Another thing is how you are going to remove that without surgery, though the disease valve. Because we just, if you put something high up, yeah. what to do with the lower down there? Yes, lower down will still so put obstruction. And if it is a regurgitant valve, then the coronary steel will be very high. If it is stenotic, effective to the stenosis to continue. Most of the valve degeneration mm -hmm. are mixed. It is so, ASAR or pure AR or so pure that's, AR. That's your controversy. Let's ask another surgeon. And what does he say? You can measure. Uh, Prashant, for a pico aortic conduit, <laughs> we are putting this in a calcified and stenotic uh, uh, valve. Hence, the flow of the coronary from retrograde is still physiological. Yeah. But when we put in a supracoronary valve, that's not a physiological. That we all know that the coronary perfusion is in the system. Here it's going to be in the, uh, in the diastole. Here it's going to be in the systole, which is absolutely not yeah. physiological. We have done some experiment, which is not experiment. In fact, we started some clinical trial where we did for stenotic coronaries, I stent, V stent, connecting the vein to the artery, which was not a physiological, and that failed. So I think that's not uh, appropriate. The appropriate thing is that today we have a uh, resilient valve where they say the V-fit technology. Then no need to fracture the valve, just dilate with the balloon and reply. But those valves, for one valve is going to come another 15, 20 years, we don't know. Here what we are dealing with, third generation valve, which are really difficult, whether it's a uh, paramount, Paramount Magna or, uh, you know, uh, 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 all those valves. Whether it's Avalus, whether it's, a, uh, you know, Resilia, they all are innovating and they have got a proper technology incorporated where valve and valve tabi is going to fix it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then let me invite Dr. Malik Parik for his presentation on a balloon expandable valve. But he did go by the femoral route. So Malik is going to show his technique. Thank you, sir, for inviting me here. Thank you, all the audience, for the uh, <coughs> being present here. So this is about alternate axles, transaxillary tower that uh, we have done. Now, one thing I want to say is today, all almost all cases are uh, possible to do with transfemoral root, and it is always all these trials of tower whether it is self-expanding or balloon expanding, based on what, based on which we have got approval for low risk, intermediate risk, they are all transfemoral tower compared to tower, not alternate axis. So the uh, non-inferiority or superiority in some aspects of tower versus tower is only with transfemoral. So when you are choosing a case for alternate axis tower, make sure it is a surgical turn down. I would like to start with that. 
uh, let, let the surgeon you know take over if it is not a suitable transfemoral case. The non-transfemoral tower has shown higher mortality and morbidity in short term compared to the transfemoral tower. Today, with decreasing sheet sizes and newer generation of more flexible tower devices, almost 90% of towers, 95% can be performed through transfemoral route. However, each high volume tower center should have expertise in at least one non-transfemoral access site, whichever is convenient to your heart team, but at least one non femoral because you may end up having a patient which is actually a surgical turn down or a high surgical risk but not a candidate for a femoral tower. So I'll just give two slides about other alternate accesses. One is intrathoracic and extrathoracic. Intrathoracic accesses are transapical and direct aortic which are I think almost given up unless uh, we have a very large sheets and you are doing some experimental devices with 20 French and 24 French sheets and doing a mitral intervention. You could direct aortic or transapical, otherwise, they're almost given up. Extra thoracic approaches transcarotid, transsubclavian or axillary, transcable and suprasternal. These are the options available. Transcarotid uh, approach is a very good, feasible approach. Surgeons are very used to exposing carotids. However, the higher stroke rates compared to transfemoral or other, trans, um, other non, non femoral sites is a concern. Transcable. Um, described lately in 2013 and um, you know you go from femoral vein puncturing the infrarenal portion of the IVC to aorta and close this defect with a uh, device later on is also an option also it requires a lot of expertise and experience trans axillary or subclavian tower so this is um, also a, an extra thoracic approach very suitable and uh, surprisingly there are trials which have compared trans axillary towers to trans femoral towers and mortality at one year is exactly same so this i find a uh, best approach best next approach if you don't have a femoral access available so there are some considerations you must consider before uh, alternate access a surgical patient must be a surgical turn down let us be very honest here it's not a if a low risk patient is there or intimidated risk patient Please, uh, you know, refrain from doing a heroic non-transfemoral tower. Avoid, the, and especially avoid these cases in your initial stages of tower journey. For alternate access, your surgeon's comfort is very important because they are going to be the ones who are going to give you access and close the access. Make sure all hardware is available. Heart team meetings, do multiple meetings, you sit with your surgeon, discuss each and every step in detail, right from local anesthesia or general anesthesia and everything and also do a recce for table and hardware arrangement you know like a cat, this will not be a typical cat lab environment you will have difficulty you'll you know you don't know where to where to you know where to make your surgeon stand where to make your anesthetist stand all these things so these are the considerations which are very important for a alternate access tower now this is a case uh, 78 years gentleman post cabg in 2013 had two previous strokes one before cabg one after cabg fortunately recovered well Echo in 2020, severe aortic stenosis, normal LV function. Patient lost to follow up because of COVID. In 2022, again, presence with heart failure, severe aortic stenosis. Now, vegetation pressure is 35%. Angiography done shows patent graphs and minor native vessel coronary artery disease, which was to be managed medically. So, what CT scan analysis, annulus area of 409 millimeters square, average sinus of also diameter 28 and average STJ 25 but you can see circumferential calcium on the sinotubular junction this is the type of patient Dr. Pradeep Yadav was talking about where the chances of uh, sinotubular junction injury with a balloon expandable valve is higher especially you are almost one is to one with the balloon so we decided to put a my valve 24.5 minus 1 cc which was about 8 percent oversized so in valves which are tricuspid with good calcification I don't like to oversize them too much not more than 8 to 10 percent and for bicuspid valves with good calcification with balloon expandable valve i usually don't oversize by more than three to five percent this was a right and left iliacs and femorals completely calcified completely occluded ct scan showed diameter of two millimeter 2.5 millimeter not possible another option direct aortic patient had a partially in aorta because of previous cabg so all entire ascending aorta was laden with calcified uh, plaques so i don't think we had any access there 
This was the subclavian axis. Now mind you, when you're considering subclavian axis, left is the preferred one always because you will come into the arch like you are coming from the femur, as if you're doing a left angiogram from the left radial artery. But here, the left, uh, so here there is a lot of calcification in the uh, subclavian area or the axillary subclavian area. And also acute bend here with calcification so we thought this was not a great idea, even the luminal diameter was very small, if you see here. So for a balloon expandable valve, you typically need a diameter more than 6 mm uh, if you want to go from subclavian axis. Then we look at the right uh, subclavian, it is, right subclavian is always more challenging uh, because uh, it, what happens is, you are, you see the trajectory, you will come right into the almost arch and descending aorta while you want to come into the ascending aorta uh, but in this case our left uh, subclavian was not great this is a typical cath lab table arrangement you would have for a subclavian tower you know this is your cath lab table i mean the cm which is on the side this is your patient these are these are your operators these are your uh, valve preparation trolleys the fonts are other way around because i could not find a diagram for a right subclavian tower so i uh, downloaded a, a diagram for a left subclavian tower and i flipped it i flipped it so the fonts are the other way around but uh, i apology for that this is where your anesthesia trolley and echo machine whatever is going to be there and this is your anesthetic trolley this is your surgical trolley so look at the femoral so we thought we'll take uh, uh, one pigtail from femoral look at the both the femorals we took this and we could not feel any femoral axis so we took this angio from a multi-purpose which we pushed down from a left radial and you can see fully calcified and uh, completely occluded iliacs and femorals anyway so uh, we had a discussion with our surgeon we exposed the axillary artery of the right side in the extra thoracic location this is the exposed axillary artery on the left upper corner with all the tributaries are kind of uh, taken control on and with, it is sometimes very deep to work on you know to take the direct puncture on the axillary it's like it's this deep all of us who do pacemakers we know how difficult it is sometimes to even uh, put that uh, purse string suture on a uh, axillary vein it is very deep so to work at such a depth we thought was challenging so our surgeon gave us a very innovative idea he said that i'll um, cut a bib dactron graft in a bevel shape and i'll sew it over on the axillary artery so it'll work outside so I said great. So this is a uh, video. This is a Dacron 10 millimeter graft which is sutured on the axillary artery in a bevel shape ma making sure that it does not create any uh, narrowing. You can see the uh, pulsations. This is the Dacron graft 10 millimeter which is sutured somewhere over here. So now I'm working outside the chest cavity. I'm not working very deep. This is a typical Seldinger puncture. So this, this Dacron graft will have an open end, but you can't work from there because otherwise it will keep bleeding. So we clamped it and we punctured the Dacron graft as if it was a femoral artery with a direct Seldinger needle. We punctured the graft over here where the marker is and this is a wire going in from the right subclavian. We dilated the puncture side first with a 7 French sheet and then with an 11 French sheet. You can see a lot of surgical instruments and uh, uh, master detractor, everything in the area. This is the 14 French python sheet over a Lundaquist wire going inside. This is the most important step here. This will, this is the uh, moment of the truth that will tell you how your case is going to be, especially for a balloon expandable valve. So the sheath went in. This is the mouth of the tip of the sheath you have to make sure the tip of the sheath lies into the arch and this is the autogram we see a lot of hardware here so th there is a underquist wire coming from the left side there is a pigtail from the right side and there is a this is the tip of the sheath python sheath then the steps are straightforward the crossing is difficult because you are coming from the right side we took a gr4 catheter and crossed the aortic valve now there is a lunder twist in the LV. This is a pre-dilatation being done from the python sheet which is from the right aortic axis, right subclavian root. 
This is the valve, 24.5 my valve crossing through the uh, python sheath which is there. This is the tip of the sheath which is into the arch. It has to be beyond the origin of the subclavian. Valve crossed well. Final positioning and final deployment. The lie of the valve is going to be different because you are coming from the right side. So always it's preferable to come from the left side but we did not have much choice here and this was the final result. Great result, good depth, no PVL and this is the final shoot after taking the sheath back gradually because normally when you are doing a subclavian case it is better to put a femoral uh, safety wire from a femoral axis so that in case you have a rupture you can put a covered stent but here there was no femoral axis. So anyway I mean these are the final shoots showing the patent subclavian and the axillary arteries and the rema and everything. So take home transfemoral tower is possible in 95% of the patient use of IVL sequential dilatation may help in difficult cases. Only transfemoral tower has shown non inferiority to sour and low risk patients. Hence, difficult tower anatomy should be considered for alternate access only if high risk for open heart surgery. Extra thoracic sites like subclavian, axillary, carotid, and suprasternal preferred over direct aortic or apical. Ask your surgeon what is his comfort. An alternate access tower has a high complication and mortality than TF tower should not be attempted in the initial curve of the tower experience. Thank you very much. Dr. Mowlik. Very, very well performed. There you go. A couple of tips. I know it's a very nice, simple, easy alternative. Uh, some surgical tips. A, uh, if you put the needle from outside, little far away, and then pass the guide wire, then you really don't need this so much of surgery, number one, because your direction, everything will be very easy. Number two, if you have put a graft, which is a good idea, we put graft always because for aneurysms, there will be prolonged ischemia of the arm, so we put the graft. Uh, if you put a graft, you don't need so many dilators and sheets, etc. What you do is you put a purse string and a snugger at the end of the graft, and through that, without any blood loss, you could do that. And that will make your life very simple. This was the dilatation for, for the puncture on the graft site, not on the artery. No, no, I understood yeah. that. Yeah. But yeah. you don't need to do anything yeah. if you put a purse string on the graft, mm -hmm. snugger, yeah. Yeah. and then it will give you no blood, lo blood loss. So, but this is very easy and very nice. How do you protect the cerebrum? I mean the brain. Sorry? How do you protect the brain? Cerebral protection. I mean, we did not have much accesses here. So, Trans, the, trans femoral protection. The, 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 it was two millimeter both sides, one millimeter. Completely operated both sides. Sure. It was, they were all reforming through collateral. So, I mean, I would have wanted, forget uh, the cerebral, if I had one femoral access, I would have wanted a safety wire of E18 going from femoral sheath into the subclavian, into the arm, because if the because by doing any chance, if the subclavian ruptures the intrathoracic part, the only thing you can do is go in from on that safety wire and put a covered stent and control the bleeding. But even we did not have even that uh, liberty or the so. So, Malik, I would yes. say that uh, if you had a femoral site, then we would have done it percutaneously. Uh, we would, would not have done all this. <laughs> yeah. We would have pre-closed it. We would have had a balloon. We would have had a uh, a dry space and we would have added dry closures. So it's clearly this could have been a percutaneous also and you know that that's feasible yeah, yeah. and possible and that's, that's an art to master also. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, it's great to combine with surgeons but because it can be done percutaneously. Yeah. <laughs> and you could have taken a radial axis on the same side for a backup if, in case of a problem. So the, already we were not uh, comfortable with the diameter huh. on the right side. It was just about 5.8. So we thought uh, with a wire and everything on the right side and we, for a, for a safety, you need a brake here, not radial because you need a larger sheet, almost 10 French. Mm -hmm. And a couple of times we have seen whenever we have attempted something brachially, the, the occlusion rates are quite high, brachial artery occlusion. So I try to usually avoid the brachial as much as possible. So um, Amalik, another thing, you know, prior to the percutaneous pre-close, uh, totally percutaneous. When we used to do subclavians, we never took the 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 vascular surgeon never gave us that. All it was was open it up and give a subcutaneous tunnel, which then makes you more coaxial. And exactly what you're saying that you then have an axis. Yeah. So you don't need the background graft, uh, yeah. and that's an easier way to do, even if it's a surgical exposure. I've done one case before with that. Uh, what you're saying with the tunnel and post string. 
two things I found difficult was one, walking very deep, you know, putting that large sheath and exchanging and everything and taking control was a little difficult with four fingers and all. And second, what I found was there are a lot of branches. I mean, I'm not a surgeon, but I realized a lot of branches coming up. So even with the best of posting, the control is not great. It keeps oozing. There are a lot of tributaries and branches. Yeah. Yeah. The good thing is you don't need to worry about the bleeding. The vascular surgeon worries about it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the oh, last comment, a, and then we'll move to the uh, next presenter. So uh, it's a great case. Uh, so we occasionally use ilia conduits for uh, pushing in the TVAR grafts. I mean, so where the surgeon takes a graft high up in the ilia. Uh, I don't know whether it was feasible in this patient, but that gives us the femoral type of transfemoral approach. The, the iliacs are occluded, Total in fact, femoral, not yeah. femorals. The iliacs itself are occluded. Right. So and it's all yeah. intraperitoneal. I would prefer even, an extra thoracic site right. yeah, compared to aorta, a peritoneal site. Aorta also look diseased. Yeah. Right. Even the Yota had disease. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Excellent presentation. And may I invite <laughs> Dr. Gopala Murugan to show another exotic case and a first in first of its kind in this part. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mathur, for your kind invitation, respect to the chair and panelists. So I'm going to present a Taver and Taver. Uh, I'm not going to talk about bailout Taver and Taver. There's been a plenty of uh, Tavers because of bailout, because the first Taver didn't go well or it was a pop out. We're going to talk about degeneration of a Taver, as a result of which patient needed another valve and we decided to go with the Taver. So this is Taver after degeneration of the original Taver. We have started to talk increasingly about lifetime management of Taver because Taver is now matured. It's 20 years since Taver. Now devices are into the fourth generation, now with the fifth generation. So therefore, this largely revolves around the longevity of the device, longevity of the actual processes. So we now have to start thinking about who's the longest living TAVR, how long is TAVR in India, how long is TMBR in India, what is their longevity, what are the best devices, how do we prevent another procedure. That's where we are. It's now uh, quite a few years into India. So what is the reality of TAVR? Same like SAVR, uh, you, they will degenerate, it's a bioprosthetic valve. And therefore, we now have to talk about TAVA valve or think about TAVA valve degeneration when we do a TAVA on the first uh, time approach. Therefore, it's very important, I want to introduce this term called target valve revalving. For coronary, we've been talking about target vessel revascularization. So here, we need to think about target valve revalving and how do we prevent it. And how do you prevent it? Get the best index TAVA done. When you do it first time, get the best procedural consideration, planning, and making sure the right kit and ingredients. I think yesterday we were talking on coronaries, you know, what do we do if we have calcium? What do we do if we don't have the kit? Now we have everything available. There is no reason that uh, we have to embark on an angioplasty if we don't have the right kit because we have a kit for everything. You know, we can have achieve, we can achieve amazing results. So if you don't have the kit, we should not attempt it, period. Minimizing uh, TAVA, uh, target valve revalving, what are the main considerations? I think it's important to use time-tested device. That's something you need because as uh, Dr. Jowli said, uh, any new product comes with a lot of noise and we'll only know, know how much the noise is reality and how much was just noise. So it's important you stick to time-tested devices. As circular a morphology of the TAVA is what you need to achieve because this rapid testing in these factories happened with a fully fully expanded valve and therefore if you don't have a fully expanded valve your longevity is not going to be the same as you would expect and trying to make sure there's absolutely no gradients and do everything possible to minimize procedural complications let me give you a case example 75 year old man he had a surgical mitral valve replacement in 2002 he had severe stenosis and he had a tower with a self-expanding it's a venous a plus from china in 2018 he subsequently had degeneration of his mitral valve, so uh, I did a TMBR with a valve in valve the sapien in 2021, and now his TAVA valve that was implanted in 2018 has now degenerated. So here, recurrent transcatheter valve procedures, that's where we are now in India in 2022. Uh, this is the echocardiogram. You can see here a self-expanding valve in position. 
and this is his uh, color flow. Uh, you can see here on the far on the far end, the mitral seems to be okay in this view, and there's clear evidence of diastolic flow uh, consistent with severe aortic regurgitation. Short axis proving the same. It's not paravalvular. It is clearly valvular, and the valve is nice and circular. Uh, again, multiple views just to make sure we're not missing a paravalvular because this is the only view on echo. You can say whether your leak is valvular or paravalvular. Uh, CT, again, standard views. Now you have to decide the landing zone is going to be inside the valve. You have to make sure that your blooming artifacts are adjusted so that you don't oversize or undersize because we're now measuring inside the valve, not the original native annulus. Uh, these are the measurements you can see here. Uh, it's important we know where the valve was implanted, exact position, because now you have to decide where you're going to implant the new valve. And how do you decide where the landing zone? That's what we're going to talk about now. This is at the level of uh, 3 millimeters, about the base of the processes, so an average diameter of 22. This is about 9 millimeter above. So I've decided to take a balloon expandable valve. It's going to be a sapien because I don't want to put another self-expanding. I don't want to have two jailing metal so I'm going to use a shorter processes and therefore it's going to be at a 20 or a 23 a 20 will be a 15 millimeter expanded that's the height of a 20 millimeter valve if you use a 23 it's going to be 18 so I want to know what is it at 15 what is it at 18 so at 15 millimeter above the base of the TAVI valve I have a mean diameter of 20 at 18 millimeter above it's 20 so around 20 to 22 is the diameter we're talking about now, what are the other procedural consideration? You can see here, this is the VTC, valve to uh, coronary distance. So we need to make sure we don't occlude the coronaries. And this is the baseline images. You can see here the TAVI. This is a coaxial view of the TAVI device. You can see the mitral valve in valve. Uh, the patient also had a mild paravalvular leak. So we also got, had uh, transeptal approach ready, but we didn't do anything. Now, this is a very, very important slide. This is an iotogram. No matter what planning you do, this is one that's going to tell us where the landing zone is going to be. Now, clearly, there is severe aortic regurgitation. I'm going to show you a still picture. Now, here, the green arrow is the original native annulus, right? Clearly, the valve that was implanted originally is quite deep. This venous A valve has markers. In fact, it should have been slightly higher up, but they didn't. It's slightly deeper. That's very obvious. Where the pink arrow is where the leaflets of the TAVA valve are. This is very, very important. So when you do a valve in valve, you want to make sure this area, which is the native, i.e. the uh, TAVA valve leaflets are destroyed and sandwiched at the same time, not too high to occlude off the coronary. So you want your landing zone somewhere here below the coronaries at the same time not too deep so that's your landing zone you want to make sure this area this uh, uh, bio this uh, tava valve leaflets are completely sandwiched that's going to be a landing zone uh, and this is a, a commander system and this is important uh, because uh, you can flex the device you can see here as it goes in uh, traditionally you will end up catching here but with the flex system you can adjust it and nicely take it in in one fluoro store you don't need to try multiple times because you should be able to flex the device and there you go it's in position so the plan is now is to implant it exactly where the lower border of the valve is going to be at these markers and the upper is going to be below the coronaries that's the target and that's the end point to be achieved and here you can see rapid pacing we know, uh, we, we know where the coronaries are, we know where the markers. I have not put a pigtail because I, I didn't see the need for that because I can see there's nothing moving, it's a fixed target. So it's a single axis um, uh, tower on this case. Again, a close up of this, you can see here, the lower border of the valve, we wanted to finish at the markers and the top, exactly there, not move away. And with Sapien, the top never moves and there's a bottom that moves up and it ends up exactly where we want it to end. And an itogram towards the end to clearly show that indeed the top of the valve was below the coronaries and the bottom was exactly where we want it to be. And this is just a, a, a recap of what it was before. You can see here the landing zones defined there 
and here this is the landing zone we got. And this is just another recap of the still images uh, and we clearly managed to sandwich the Tava valve leaflets inside the Sapien. Uh, this is the post echo, uh, clearly the AR is gone as expected and uh, on the long axis also the patient had a very good outcome and uh, was discharged. So to conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think in minimizing target valve revalving is the way forward. We need to plan well in advance. It's all about planning, planning and planning. Use the best ingredients. That's what determines taste and gets the most optimal procedure. There's absolutely no uh, excuse for anything less than the best currently in 2022 because everything is available. And of course, the last but not the least, surgical AVR is indeed a fantastic option. Let's not forget it, you know, just because we're TAVA, let's not just push TAVA. And now we're increasing going into low risk patients. They're sometimes better off with surgery than TAVA. And this is indeed the uh, first EVOLUTAR. I just wanted to answer the question that I raised. This is the longest follow-up we have of EVOLUTAR valve, it's seven year. And this is the longest mitral follow-up we have in our country, which is six years. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And before I finish, for those of you interested in valves, on behalf of all the course directors uh, in this uh, podium, I'd like you to block your dates for 9, 10, 11 India valves, which is going to be a dedicated transcatheter valve conference nationally. And I'm sure you're all aware of Thank you. We are actually looking forward to the Goa trip. Yes. <laughs> this is a beautifully done case. And maybe, Pradeep, if you want to make an additional comment, since we talked about the failed valves earlier. So this is a balloon expandable valve and the placement, since there's already a mitral pro uh, valve also over there. Right. So what precautions? Yes, so I, I think that one of the coronary issue was this was a good luck case because your coronaries were already above the risk plane of the aortic position. So you did not have to do any sort of uh, coronary wiring, which is what you had predicted on your CT. As far as the previous yeah, mitral okay. prosthesis in a balloon expandable valve, sometimes like the mitral yeah. prosthesis mitral can mitral jump mitral your balloon, mitral. right? And you can yeah. end up more aortic than usual. But I guess you, you were watching that and you probably had some forward tension yeah, deployed yeah. in position. I think even if we optimize these first index procedure, these bioprostheses mm -hmm. will fail with time. It's a matter of time, whether it's six, whether it's eight years, 10 years, 12 years, they will come back. So your point is well taken. Do your best to optimize and then deal with them. I, th I think I was lucky because the first tower implant was a bit low. Mm -hmm. It's actually to my luck exactly. because generally a self-expanding valve is supra annular. So had they implanted in a perfect position, yes. my leaflets would be at the level of the coronary and I'd have had a nightmare. This is a problem of self-expanding supra annular valves and you will have a problem when they come down for a tablet tablet. This is a point, I think I got lucky, that's something I must admit. Yeah, so, so when you plan these valve and valves, of course you have to measure the skirt heights, and you were talking about lifetime management of aortic stenosis. So if you have a low risk patient, say 50, what is your choice of first valve if you are going to put a cavity? I put a second, second, because I want as less no. material. Uh, and the next question is to all of, all of uh, all of you all, because whether would you no, put no, a more durable? I think the rationale is very important. Why? And uh, because now, if they're low risk, they go for surgery. Period. There's no question about it. But if a low risk, for whatever reason, you've decided they can't have surgery, uh, you know, you're going to have a, a valve. You want to put the least material. It's just common sense. And you want to make sure your coronary doesn't have anything jading there. And you want to put as big a valve as possible. What you don't want in a low risk is put a 20 or 23. You know. If you can put a 26 period, and if you want to put anything less, you might as well go for surgery. Uh, that's the rationale behind my thought. But I might be wrong and open for So uh, before we move to the next presentation by Harish, which we can set up now, uh, one last comment. Yeah. And after I this, was... we will be uh, moving on to the plenary lecture by Dr. Ebhard Grube. He's over here with us. Welcome, Ebhard. And we are ready to go with you next. So. Uh, First uh -huh. cut is the deepest cut I mentioned in the morning. That is the best cut you have in human heart, whether it is stained or the valve. So best bulb, I think uh, the first bulb should be a balloon expandable valve for future things. Now every human being is born with some heart rate quota and you cannot exhaust this quota by unnecessary tachycardia. Similarly, the durability of the valve, the new concept is the motion life and the total motion of the valve it makes in lifetime is also kind of fixed. 
So you have to reduce this motion light by giving small dose of beta blockers, where perhaps the low dose of beta blocker keep the heart rate down, can increase the neurolithium up. So it's a put for thought. So just one last comment, sir. Uh, there was a recent paper published from Cleveland Clinic, Explant Tavi. Uh, the surgeons operated on patients who had failed transcatheter valve. Fifty percent of those indic patients had indication of infective endocarditis. So that's very important as we are taking up TAVI in our routine practice. You see the patients who underwent surgery, 50% of those patients had infective endocarditis. So I think we should be doing TAVI as if we are doing a surgical EVR and not a stent. Yeah, the, the other comment that I have is that it's too, uh, I think it's too black and white to say that it'll be balloon expandable in the young people and self expandable in the elderly. I think that's really, uh, uh, the variations of anatomy are so huge that you have to select the right valve. For example, we still don't know the durability of a balloon expandable valve, which is a different tissue altogether versus a self-expandable. Uh, there's indirect data and now the trials are going on to see which is more durable. And certainly it still stands out for the self-expandable Evolute R platform. That's the better durability because that was in the Notion trial as well, up to eight years and nine years of follow-up. The second aspect comes in, what's the point putting in a less than a 23 millimeter balloon expandable valve? We keep telling the surgeons that they'd be unfair to the patients if it's less than a 23 millimeter valve. And actually 50% of the balloon expandable valves which are being implanted are less than 23, 23 millimeter valve. So that's another point to keep in mind. And then you have the, all those anatomical differences, including outflow tract calcification, bicuspid anatomy, where you're giving residual grade, gradients. Uh, you have the cell balloon expandable, which we also have experience of a written, but again, that's not the best sort of device to do where you get an oval orifice and you're actually trying to make it round and circular. So we have all those issues and you still don't know the durability of a balloon expandable constrained valve in a bicuspid anatomy, which constitutes 30% of our patients. So I think we've got a lot to answer than just actually say that this is a, uh, for, it's all balloon expandable for young people or younger people. Except, except small you know, annulus, I think, uh, balloon expandable valve in lifetime is more important. Tab, tab in tab, tab in sab, sab in tab. Much and, a anatomy. Anatomy. Yeah, and a bicuspid anatomy. Yeah, and a bicuspid anatomy. Yes. <laughs> so over to you now, Harish. Thank you. I think this can go on. We can ask Professor Grube later about this. And thank you, Atul, for having me here. I had this dilemma, that's why I asked again. Okay, today I'm discussing the first double valve we did was a few years back. This is a 70-year-old female, rheumatic heart disease, hypertensive. And as you see, the mitral valve was with a Hancock 25 millimeter valve, and AVR was Hancock 21 millimeter valve. She had both bioprosthetic valve dysfunction. And as you know, Hancock is not uh, fracturable, so we had to put smaller valves. That's why uh, my question is going to be Dr. Jowli later. He does, should a surgeon do routine CTs now prior to putting surgical valves. That's my going to be a question to you after I finish my presentation. Should you all do CTs to get the right size of valves in? So the CT analysis, which is very important here, the most important thing is to confirm the valve you have and of course see the new LVOT. Because when you put two valves, there's always a risk that anyways, TMVR itself can cause LVD obstruction. Here you're going to put two valves in. So this analysis confirms the valve we had and the new LVOT seemed okay. So we knew the the TMVR would be safe in such a patient. And after the CT analysis, this was the true ID of the uh, aortic valve. So this valve that would fit in was be an Evolute 23 or a S320. Since it's a valve in valve with a small valve, we went for a self-expanding valve. And the uh, mitral valve had an inner ID of 20.5, which would go with a Sapien or a My valve 23. The challenge is that any procedure involving both valves is a high risk procedure. We were deciding whether we should do together or do one at a time. This is a frail lady which was 46 kilos. We decided to relieve the aortic valve first and in our earlier days, of course, this was our first septal puncture for TMVR. So we thought we'll do the septal puncture before we proceed with the TAVI. But now with TE guidance, you don't have to do that anymore. You can do it after you finish the TAVI. So right femoral axis was the aerotogram and pressures, right femoral vein was the TMVR, left femoral artery was for index axis for TAVI, and left femoral vein was for the TPI. And we do take, in our initial days, we used to take additional axis for our pressure monitoring. So this is how we started. We first did the septal puncture, TE guided. And this was, uh, 
we wanted to be sure that we are in ferro posterior height in these cases really doesn't matter but of course you should not go too high otherwise it gets difficult to valve across so that's very important that apex distance to the puncture site is important once you've done that we proceeded with the tavi and lvot is already been discussed what should be a lvot and anything less than 200 now even 180 150 is acceptable and the aortomitral angle so more parallel it is less is the risk of lvot obstruction tavi was a regular procedure we crossed the regular way and we used 23 evolute r and uh, deployed almost zero we got a gradient less than 10 mm of mercury and then we went across with a tmvr using the agilis sheath we easily crossed the valve we did a transeptal puncture and there's a tmvr and this is how both the valves looked on fluoroscopy that was the end result for the aortic and there was the end result for the mitral so the mr was reduced to trivial with no residual ms procedure was completely successfully and further hospital stay of the patient was uneventful thank you very much there's a lot of meticulous planning i'm sure which goes into it so because when the two valves going to be there so what all ct measurements are very important uh, ajit yeah i think uh, we have done a couple of these now and uh, what you do is always do the aortic first so that you know we are sure that you're not impinging on the mitral though so we do all the ct pictures before and be sure about the angles we are clear you finish the aortic first and then you go transeptal and you finish the mitral as you rightly did a uh, couple of things the ct is very important not only for sizing the valves but also for the angles and virtually you can create uh, a picture which will show alveolar obstruction which is going to happen if it's going to be alveolar obstruction then you have to treat the septum which is another issue which could happen in a few patients where you can have a if the septum is the cause then you may need to create a septal ablation of the septum uh, transcatheter so as to fix the septum so these are the technical issues in these patients for surgeons unlike uh, tavar so much anatomy is really not required we're going to go inside what is most important for us are the sizes of the root and annulus and by today echocardiography has matured so much that if it is done with seriousness we can get everything from you problem is most of the time is not done very seriously and every time we have problems and surprise on the table but ct is not necessary and i feel one comment can i am i allowed to about these two meetings of chip india and india valves i have been attending for many years they all are matured this activity small groups are tight this is the time to make indian guidelines and i think it will settle a lot of froth and it's unlike surgeons the cardiologists would definitely follow guidelines better than surgeons and i think this is the time to <laughs> i think uh, those th that's a very relevant point and i think we will definitely work on it along with the surgeons to form a uh, guideline which can help us to select the right patient because tavi therapy is out of pocket expense for our indian patients and becomes more relevant compared to the western world where it's all you know aishman bharat uh, in uk and elsewhere and so great case uh, congratulations uh, we have almost two years follow up of such a first transcatheter double valve and you did everything right the uh, aortic first and second mitral because if you do mitral first and then aortic the mitral valve will project into the lvot uh, uh, what do you do with the asd you have created ultimately long term it closes let, let me let me frame, let me frame the thoughts like horse shivert is here and he is a great proponent for afr and ajit was mentioning up about afr for heart failures with preserved ejection fraction even for heart failure reduced ejection fraction so if you keep the asd intact i mean little uh, for longer period of time would it help left to right shunt will work as atrial shunt and relieve uh, the dis dysfunction these people have or you close it down so yeah there's a there's a debate i had with pradeep when we were doing a tmvr together so the guidelines say that if you have a drop of saturation on table by more than 2% so if you have a 96 you go down to 94 there's an indication of closing the asd especially in older people where they have more of lv dysfunction 
Maybe in a younger patient you could leave it. But in an older patient, I would close it if there's a clear drop of saturation. So we have a case series of about 26 cases of TMBR. And we've had to do a closure of the uh, shunt only once. And that is when there was a right to nerve shunt. So, you saw the drop so of basically, otherwise, just leave it alone. Uh, don't try to add another procedure on that. Any more comments? Uh, one of the things that we do in a transcatheter double valve replacement uh, is uh, what we call as key balm, which means uh, when we see that the new LVOT is less than 180, calculated new LVOT, we put a simultaneous balloon in the left ventricular outer tract and expand the mitral valve uh, just to reduce the incidence of LVOT. Thank you very much, Harish, and uh, thank you, everybody. This was a very interesting session.